The first time I ever saw the State Hospital was when I went there with a friend to photograph it um, and we were able to go inside and around the inside of the building and I wanted to learn a lot more about it after that because I had no idea what it was or what it was for or anything. I just knew that it was a large mental hospital. And I found out that the preservation group in Fergus Falls called Friends of the Kirkbride would give tours. So a few months later, I signed up for a tour and I went on a tour. And that was the first time that I ever met Jean and Maxine Schmidt. This building is something that makes Fergus Falls unique. We have something that very few other places have. People go to Europe to look at castles. We have our own right here. And the architecture of the building is magnificent. And we all know they don't build buildings like this anymore and never will again. Uh, the craftsmanship isn't there anymore. Uh, and that in itself is a reason to keep it. As I said, we, are, we have something that is unique. It's unique in the fact that it's the most complete Kirkbride building yes. that is still standing in the United States. Thomas Kirkbride was a physician in Pennsylvania in the 1800s who cared for mentally ill people. And he came up with the plan, the idea uh, of what kind of building would best house mentally ill people. He said it should be a long, narrow building with a center corridor, patient rooms on either side of that corridor, and every patient room has a window. What was the treatment in those early years? fresh air and sunshine, warm milk and rest. Pretty simple, right? So later I found out that there is an arts organization in Fergus Falls called Springboard for the Arts and they had just started a artist residency program on the grounds of the state hospital in one of the old outbuildings. So I decided to apply to it and I was accepted and that was my introduction to Springboard for the Arts. The Hinge Art Residency Program that is up at the Kirkbride um, was developed by um, knowing that there was a need in the community to be able to tell stories and to create conversations about the building itself and the presence that it's had in our community and the history of the building. Ethan was one of our first Hinge Art artists uh, who was part of the program doing these interviews with people from the community so that they could have a voice and have a actual object with their photograph taken and then their interview that he did with them and making it into a book where it's a book that is about history and the lives of people in Fergus Falls related to the building. So my project was to photograph and interview old employees and patients of the hospital in an attempt to connect their lives and experiences to the building and bring some humanity back to this place that is empty and falling apart. And as time went on and I interviewed more and more people, I began to see this hospital as not just an old historic building, but more so a place where some sick people were helped and where a lot of employees spent very large parts of their lives helping these people. When I started there, um, the patients that on the unit that I worked, I started on the Young Doll unit, and the patients that I took care of had been there, some of them 20 years, some of them 30 years. You know, it was a longer term hospital stay at that time. It's a lot different than what it is now. But that place, that the state hospital, that unit got to be home for them in almost kind of a way we. Um, I don't want to say we're family, but in a way we were, you know, their biggest support. But you have to understand at that time and back in that era, there weren't group homes out in the community. There weren't um, 
a lot, if any, adult foster care homes. Um, there was no other place for patients to go. While patients were there, it was a, like a small community in itself. It had a farm, it had animals, um, it had gardens, and all those things patients could get jobs and work. And that they could work in the kitchen, they could work in uh, the woodshop woodworking. You know, they had jobs, they got paid, and it was kind of a, a way for them to build their self esteem, to have some spending money to buy, you know, whether it be clothes or something fun for them. We had a gentleman that would wheel his wheelchair to the window almost every day and wait for his brother to come, and he never did. Um, that was that was hard to see that. Some had um, family that didn't understand, didn't um, kind of, I don't want to use the word wrote them off, but you know, pretty much they weren't a part of the family anymore. Um, so did some of them want to be there? Um, in the sense that it was some place to go and it was warm and it was safe and people cared about them, sure, in that respect. Was it a huge hospital with a lot of people? Absolutely. Um, did we take care of each person individually? Absolutely. I think we're focusing more now in this day and age on um, individualizing and finding strengths and weaknesses of patients and adjusting our care to their needs. We had more to offer our patients in regards to doing things. You know, like I said, we went on bus trips and I mean, we had patients were out in the community too. We took them shopping, um, we took them on fishing trips, we took them out to restaurants. I mean, those are all benefits. Um, things like that right now usually are not allowed. Um, and I think for those that did end up going home or maybe to another facility or whatever, uh, they're already familiar with the community, and I think that made the transition a little bit easier. Well, I started the state hospital back in 1984, and I was a cook supervisor. I was hired as a cook supervisor. And um, I, from 1984 to 1995, I um, supervised 58 people in the kitchen. Um, also, the baker had retired probably five years into my employment there, so then I became the baker the last four, four or five years of, of my career in the kitchen. And then they start downsizing in the 90s to where when I first started there, there was about 750 patients there. And by the time, oh, I think we got down to 350 people by the time they started laying people off, you know, and they were putting, um, they had started an MI initiative program, and then they were putting um, developmentally disabled people out into the community. It was, it was, it was quite the job. We, um, for, gosh, we had our own butcher, we had our own baker, we made everything from scratch. Um, um, approximately when I was baking, I would, we were doing approximately 300 loaves a day. And then on our cookie days, we'd do about 2,000 cookies, you know, and then we'd freeze them and use them as needed. And we had um, big walk-in freezers. We had um, go-karts the girls would drive that would pull the food carts that would deliver all the food out to the units, and they would deliver them through the, the tunnels. Let's say we're making a, 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 a a hot dish, you know, for 750 people, you're looking at about 200 pounds of ground beef. But 200 pounds of, of ground beef, our butcher would have it all ready for us, and, and we'd brown that off, and then we'd have these big kettles. That we'd have, um, they look like canoe paddles, the big, huge paddles that we would stir the, the you know, the, the soup or the, the ground beef or whatever, in, and then we'd make noodles, and another one, we'd put the hot dish together and make our white sauce, put it all together, and then in a big kettle. Um, there was three deadlines a day. You know, you had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and there was no, you had to keep those those times that you could make or break everybody's day. If you were late with a meal, everybody had a bad day, you know, so if you put out a good meal, you know, generally people had a, had a good day, you know, and so 
So in that aspect, we, we could, you know, like I said, if we had a bad day in the kitchen, everybody had a bad day. If we put out a bad meal, you know, every client, there would, there would be behavioral problems, you know, from, you know, so, so we had to ensure that we put out good meals every day and that helped the staff out quite a bit by, by putting out a good meal. And the developmentally disabled, the mentally ill, and, and the, the chemically dependent people that, that stayed there were just, you know, making their day, I guess, you know. And like I said, food service, you can make or break everybody's day, and so our plan was to, you know, put out a good bill and at least give them a good meal every day, you know, so they could put up with everything else that they, that they were dealing with at the time. A lot of the old employees say that the hospital was like an entire city or town in and of itself. And there was one person that I spoke to named Shirley who actually wrote the newspaper for the small town called The Weekly Pulse. I was in rehab. We'd, uh, when we'd take them for walks, we'd have uh, game sessions for the, these are just the patients, that type of thing. We were preparing them to go outside. Uh, we'd cook with them, mm, do their hair, you know, just get them used to being on the outside. This one patient, this is a favorite story of mine, I thought everyone was happy to go home, okay? And uh, Teresa was going home and I came up to her and I hugged her and I said, we're gonna miss you, but I'm sure you're so glad to go home. She burst into tears. She did not want to go home. She liked being at the hospital. <laughs> so, there's things that you don't think about. We were working with the community college, and students could live at the dorm at the hospital for working two hours a day and they lived there. Well, they would uh, visit with the patients or patients in a wheelchair, they'd wheel them around. Um, they'd play games with them and like a regular employee only they didn't have the, they could never be alone with them or anything. They would help the staff. And by and large, they were pretty good. And my own mother was probably in her late 70s, she lived in the southern part of town. She called me up and she said, Shirley, one of your patients, are they're at my house going by. And I said, Mom, how do you know it's one of my patients? Well, Shirley, she's got a nurse's cape on and she doesn't have a stitch on otherwise. <laughs> so Grandma decided it was one of ours. <laughs> and she was right, of course. Okay, it's the Weekly Pulse. I don't know, it was just the newsletter for the hospital. And it listed the activities. It gave a calendar of what was going to happen. Um, and it had a calendar of the church services. Um, just like a little newspaper, really. It was like a small town, very small town. But if I missed s someone, you know, sending out the newsletter, I'd get a call, how come I didn't get my pulse? And I, at the time, didn't realize the employees that had left wanted that. They wanted to keep in touch with where they'd worked. And they, it was very important to some of those older people. When I first started, too, it was interesting because it was much more custodial care when I first started in the 60s. I started in January of 1960. Very much custodial care, uh, making sure people were had dressed and up and moving about, took them to meals and stuff like that. And as time went on, they changed the philosophy. Medications came in, philosophy of treatment changed. Our job descriptions changed. What we did uh, become a point where I was doing group therapy and individual therapy and doing more individual work with the client than, than when I started. And that's when my job got interesting when I was able to do those things. 
I like the fact that I had so many opportunities to do so many different things. I am a caregiver by nature and it was good to be able to take care of people and see them change. To see them come in really, really sick and have them leaving, being able to live in society again and living with their families and functioning in a much more calm, rational way than they had when they come in. We would have the families of chemically dependent people come in. They would live at the hospital for two and a half days. We would have them go through a lot of the same stuff that their family member did that was in treatment. They'd go through lectures and groups and sharing and that type of thing. It was a time when we helped the families learn what chemical dependency was, how they were affected by it, because most families thought it was just the alcoholic or chemically dependent that had the problem, not me. Uh, and when they became aware of the fact of how much they'd been affected, it really changed their lives and they were able to make big changes in those two and a half days. I remember my first time I worked with the family program alone, a woman came in and she left looking 10 years younger than she had coming in. There was such a relief and she had gotten rid of a lot of the guilt and found some self-worth and found that she wasn't the failure that she thought she had been. And she really, and a lot of people would come in doing that. And I would see people after, years after, and they would talk about the fact that family was so important and how they had changed and how it changed their life. I guess I'd say it was a, my job was to help people who were sick, help them get better. I think and that's what the hospital was, was a place to help people that were sick get well again so they could go home. This place was open a really long time, more than a century, and you can, if you start going back and looking at some of these, the history of treatment and mental health care, there's a lot of things that happened in the past that aren't very well understood today, are sensationalized a lot of the time, when in the context of history, those things were done with the best interest of patients at the time. You just would not believe the difference in the people um, from when they would first have a treatment and then after their series had been administered, what they turned into, it was just like night and day on some people. And we helped with shock treatments and more the recovery after their treatment and stuff because they would be very confused for a while after their shock treatment. But I know this one lady and she came in and off. She had the foulest mouth, just, just horrible. Not like her at all. She never said a bad word about anybody or to anybody, but she sure did when she came in. And after her treatments, she was back to herself. So it, they were very effective if they were right for them. I loved my job. Wow. I loved my job. I, because you were helping people, well, that you figured didn't know how to help themselves. We were able to focus uh, in, and do whatever was necessary within our resources to help some very serious uh, mental health issues. I thought when I went up there that I'd been practicing for a long time anyway, <laughs> several decades that I was never going to see anything new that I hadn't seen before. And while I was there, we started getting cases of dissociative disorder, which was uh, in the press, you know, often popularized as multiple personality disorders. And we started getting several of those cases and we kind of became the, the go-to institution where they would send 
these extremely difficult dissociative cases. And I was the one that probably worked with them the most. So that was very challenging and very interesting. During the time I was there, the memo came out, the direction had been taken. It was a statewide movement to shut all the regional treatment centers down. So as they started downsizing and taking away the resources and, uh, you know, making treatment uh, a lot more difficult, uh, it became a lot harder, you know, to do the good quality work that we were able to do originally when I went up there. There were many staff there that were very dedicated to doing the best they could to help the residents that they had. The community members were really involved at the State Hospital while it was open. And even today it's closed and there's still a large group of people who are trying to once again involve their community with the State Hospital, like Springboard for the Arts trying to involve artists or Jean and Maxine Schmidt, who started Friends of the Kirkbride in an attempt to save the building from demolition. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do an interview with Ethan as well because I was born here in Fergus Falls um, and raised in Fergus here um, my life. And I was involved in Brownies and Girl Scouts and 4-H. And so because of that, we would go up there and we would be doing art projects, also put on winter carnivals for the patients. Um, and also do Christmas caroling. So the building has been a part of my life and also um, the people that were up there, you know, have been an influence in my life as well of how I've created work. Um, and with being able to do the interview with Ethan on a more personal level as well and actually seeing my photograph taken up on one of the, uh, one of my most favorite objects up there, which is uh, the teeter-totter. Um, having that experience and then being able to have my photograph taken and then explain what I've done and how it's influenced me. Um, it made me feel more, more a part of the project of why we're here, why we're trying to save the building and to have these stories be told and to have the creative side of it come out of all of these different artists with all of their different projects. We've been told that historic preservation takes three Ps. You need passion. And I think anybody that talks to us can tell that we have passion for this place. Perseverance, which we have certainly persevered. And the most difficult one is patience. Why would you tear it down? Just look at it. This is a gorgeous building. They don't build them like this anymore. Somebody needs to do something. And I kept saying, somebody needs to do something. And finally the light bulb went off and I thought, maybe that somebody was me. I, I got called up to the state hospital by the person in charge at that time and he said would you be the volunteer leader of the tours i said sure and that's where all this started and we spent 11 years giving tours to the general public and educating people about what an asset we had here in fergus falls people have come from all over we've had people from 45 of the 50 I states so. I, went, I think we're up to, and 10 countries uh, that have come to Fergus Falls to take our tour. So it has certainly been a tourist destination. It has been a, um, an awesome experience for us. People are amazed. I mean, you can walk around it, you can drive around it, but until you really see it up close and personal and hear the stories, um, we tell a lot of stories about what took place there. We're, we, we do educate people about what this building meant and uh, yeah, it's been an awesome journey. Well, the, it's a, a massive building. I mean, the, it, it's hard to describe. You go up the second floor in the tower building, the beautiful wood floors are there and still shiny and the fireplaces are there that they put in. Other parts of the building, they have been torn out or covered. Uh, it's just awesome. Yeah. The tower building is absolutely magnificent, and I don't believe the city will ever tear that down. But One thing in the tower building is the grand staircase, and that brings out, oh, ah, every time mm -hmm. people come in and mm -hmm. see it. It's a beautiful 
slate staircase with uh, figurines on the uh, posts going up the stairway and stuff, and it's fantastic. I love East Detached. It is uh, just gorgeous. Uh, it's one huge room with the pillars, and there's decorative um, things on the top of the pillars, including in the basement. You have that decorative edging in the basement on those pillars. And I just love it back there. It's beautiful on a sunshiny day, and you have these huge windows all over. But that was all part of the therapy, let the sunlight in. I've been working on this a really long time, and no matter how much I do or what I say, I don't think I will ever be able to really convey to the people how much this place meant to all the people who worked and lived and died here. But there's a woman who wrote a letter to me who I think she explains it better than I ever could. And she says, it was a world all of its own, but it was a wonderful world of many different things. Love, laughter, pain, and joy. A place you will never forget. And the hospital itself, were one big family, I guess you could say. We were like a small community and we all knew each other real well. And, and just providing a, a good service to the the clients that we had there. It wasn't always an easy job, but we were always there for each other and we gave each other a lot of support. And even though I'm sure there were days where I didn't want to go to work, I can't remember those days because I really liked that job. And I have to say, I, I in talking to my co-workers from past and present, for the most part, that's what they say too. There was a, a almost a family between the patients and the staff. Uh, everyone got to know one another really well. Uh, and I would, I would go back again. I would probably... No, I don't know that I would do anything different. It was fun. And I, I really enjoyed my job. I know I'm not the only one. I have heard many, many of my coworkers say that was the best job. It was very rewarding. Rewarding and humbling at the same time.